Father, I thank you um, that you desire to speak to your people tonight. I thank you that you've given me, given me an assignment. I thank you for making your voice clear. I pray that you open up the ears of your people to be able to hear clearly and vividly. Uh, give me language for the things that you desire to say. Give me words. Um, help me not to, to soup it up, sugarcoat it, or make it nice and fancy and pretty or political, Father. Help me to speak the truth, nothing more, nothing less, um, boldly, unapologetically, um, standing on your word, Father. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. <sighs> I see you getting better. That's good to know. Um, now, if y'all got praise reports, y'all can drop them in the comments. Um, prayer requests, hopefully we'll be able to get to some of those um, at the tail end. Um, listen, without further ado, um, I was very intentional about not putting an actual topic of discussion um, for this midweek encouragement tonight. I was very intentional about that. Um, because what I want to talk about tonight, um, I didn't want it to be clickbait. Um, I, the title that I wanted to put up, I absolutely know that a bunch of people probably would have clicked in just to hear what I wanted to say on this particular topic. Um, or maybe even to jump in the comments and to give their opinions. Um, and so i I purposely intentionally did not put a topic, um, because those who are faithful, those who are always on, those who follow the ministry, those who are hungry, those are the people who will be jumping on tonight. Um, and those are the people that I'm speaking to. I want to be very clear. The people that I'm speaking to tonight um, are those who are hungry, um, are the regulars, are Flowing Life Outreach and Worship Center, our people and visitors and those who are hungry for the word of God. Um, and so I was very purposeful and intentional about not putting a caption about what we're talking about tonight. However, once we get into it, if you feel like you need to tag somebody or share it um, or get it out, then I absolutely encourage you to do that. Um, but I don't want to belabor this. I want to go ahead and jump right in because I don't want to take too much time uh, with this. But I, I, I do think I know my assignment for tonight. Um, and I'm praying that God give me boldness to stand on his word to deliver this message. Important. Exodus chapter two. <clears throat> Exodus chapter two. <clears throat> um, actually, Exodus chapter one. Let's start there. Exodus chapter one. I told you it's going to get heavy really fast. Um, so y'all just keep up with me on this. Um, it says in verse seven, Exodus chapter one, verse seven, it says the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them. Right now, there rose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. So now they no longer had favor. The people had grown mighty. But now they now they didn't have favor. Verse nine. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. That's worth taking a note right there. Even before I go any further, they're saying that the people are mighty. They continue to grow and expand and increase. They became mighty. A new king came in place. And then he said the people are becoming mightier than we. He didn't have a problem with them being mighty. He had a problem with them being more mighty than we. Right. Let's keep reading. Um, <clears throat> verse 11, uh, verse 10. Then uh, come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happen in an event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us. So go up out of the land. Therefore, set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they build for Pharaoh supply cities and pit them and Ramses. Watch this, y'all. <clears throat> they dealt shrewdly. They dealt wisely. They said, we're not, we don't have a problem with them being mighty. We have a problem with them being mightier than us. So what we're going to do is to prevent them from increasing to the point where they end up overtaking us. Let's figure out a way that we can afflict them 
This is what it says in verse 12. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew and they were in, were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians, they made them serve with rigor, right? And they made their lives bitter. They made their lives hard with bondage in mortar and brick in all the manner of the service of field. All their service in which they had made them serve was with rigor. Follow me, y'all. This is this is. This speaks to everything of our current world of politics, um, laws, regulations, things being passed down, happening in our current world, controversial subjects, divisive um, conversations that's happening right now. Listen, um, the king of Egypt did not have a problem with them being mighty. He had a problem with them being mightier than him. So he set laws in place intentionally against them to prevent them in case in their increase they decided to set themselves up in war against the king because they would be too mighty for the king <clears throat> sounds political sounds very political um for you to put something in place to keep a group of people down or to limit the amount of people being produced um, this is the part where I have to walk heavy. Um, don't allow yourself to be swayed, lied to, or convinced that this law that have been that has been overturned that the reason that they put it in place was to side with the believer i don't know if y'all understanding what i'm saying tonight i'm gonna try to make this as plain and simple as i possibly can um there's a such thing as politics what politics is, is a chess match to see what pawns, what pieces we can put in place to move our pieces across the board and most strategically put ourselves in position to win the game. Right. Um, what politics is, is we have Democrats and we have Republicans. I understand we got bipartisans and a bunch of other groups. By and large, we have Democrats and Republicans constantly bumping heads. And we're forced to have to choose which one we're going to join parties with. I want to speak boldly tonight and declare to you th to this <laughs> to this fact tonight, um, just in case y'all didn't know, just in case y'all was wondering. I don't consider myself a Democrat or a Republican. Because on the Republican side, there are things that I don't like. On the Democratic side, there are things that I don't like. But there is one thing that stands firm regardless of what is changing, regardless of everything that will continue to be altered, regardless of every law that will be put in place and every law that will be changed and every regulation that will be uh, motivated by, uh, by evil intentions. There's one thing that never changes. And that is the word of God. Listen, y'all, I don't have notes tonight. I'm going off of my assignment that God has given me to speak to you boldly. Um, I live according to the word of God. And one of Satan's greatest ploys, one of his greatest tools, his weapons that he uses is dividing the body of Christ. Listen, y'all, we've seen the body divided by so many other things. But this issue has become something divisive, even amongst Christians, because people have been duped and lied to into thinking that if the law, if there is a law passed that favors what we believe, then automatically we need to jump on board and to back everything that it stands for, not knowing what's behind it. There's po there's political uh, intentions and motives that are driving what's going on in the background. Listen, the children of Israel. They were growing mighty. Um, they were becoming more mighty than the king. And he said, let's put something into place to regulate how many people um, are being born. Right. 
Once he couldn't regulate how many people were being born, um, uh, well, before he regulated how many people were being born, he said, well, let's, let's, let's think shrewdly, right? Uh, let's do something that, that, that um, will cause them um, to slow down in their production. Let's do something that will cause them to become weary. Let's give them rigorous work that will cause them to become de depleted, that will weaken them, that will cause them to lose strength, that will cause them to faint. Once they found that that wasn't working, right? Um, because it said that the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. This is one of the main parts that I want to get to, and there's so much to dig through through here. It said um, in verse 16, and he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools. Hope I don't lose people here. If it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. If it is a son, kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. Politics. Um, Y'all, I don't even really have to dig really deep uh, for you to see this. Two of the uh, groups of people that Satan attacks the most, uh, and I, I won't even say the most, um, but you see that you see the uh, these attacks um, are very, uh, vital, uh, to generations, uh, to our culture, um, to our families. Um, and that is men and that is children. We see here that he said, if it is a son, if it is a man, if it is a boy, kill him. Right. Um, because if I remove the boys, if I remove the man, then I can disintegrate the family. I can destroy the family at its core. We know this. I don't got to dig too much in this. But how do I attack the woman? Because the woman seems to be pretty strong. In a lot of marriages, I would argue that sometimes the woman is a little bit more spiritual. The woman sometimes has a little bit stronger foundation, even though the man might be the head and might be the decision maker or might be the breadwinner. Sometimes you'll found, find that the woman is the foundation, that sometimes the woman uh, is the one that can see things sometimes before the husband. Sometimes the woman is the one that starts to pick up in things in the spirit, but has to be patient with the man until he picks it up to, to allow him to lead the family. But how can I get to the woman? How can I get to the female? How can I get to the wife? How can I get to the mother? The way that I can get to the mother is through her seed, it's through the child. If this is heavy, <clears throat> if I can have a woman that is battling with her emotions because of a miscarriage, If Satan can have your mind twisted because maybe you're one of those who made a decision to have, a, have an abortion, maybe you're one of those who knows somebody who had an abortion, uh, maybe you're one of those people who uh, maybe your mother had a few miscarriages before you came into the world. Um, maybe you're one of those people who, who, who uh, your parents considered having an abortion maybe with you. Uh, get to a woman because women are strong. But if you want to get to a woman, a woman is a nurturer. A woman cultivates. A woman grows a seed. If you want to get to a woman and you mess with her seed, you mess with a thing that she's been created to nurture. You mess with a thing that she's been created to carry. I got y'all. I know I'm saying a lot of stuff that's really heavy right now, and I hope it's not going over your heads. If you want to destroy the family, remove the man. If you get these strong women that can carry a family on her shoulders with the man removed, then all I have to do is mess with your seed, is to mess with your child. 
If you talk to anybody who has had a miscarriage, if you speak to anybody who has had an abortion or elite or even considered it, if you talk to anybody who has had problems with pregnancy, if you talk to anybody who has had um, a situation where maybe they had a stillbirth, if you talk to any woman who has had any of these problems, this is not a problem that you have and then tomorrow you're over it. This is not a problem that you have and then uh, somebody, you know, you just have another child to replace the one that you lost. This is not a problem that you can go to one class of counseling and it just fixes everything. This is not something that you pray about one time and then all of your worries and struggles just go away. This is something that sticks with you. This is something that you don't forget. This is something that damages your psyche. It messes with your mental. If you want to destroy the family, remove the man or remove the seed. says that the king says, kill every son. This is the part that I love about this. In verse 17, it says, but the midwives feared God. Y'all, this is so good right here. This is everything. I got stuck on this one verse right here. But the midwives feared God. Watch this right here. The king gave a command. The king gave a mandate, right? This was not an opinion. This was not a state law or legislation that said, hey, we're giving you the option. You can do it or you don't have to do it. He gave a command. He said, every child that is born, if it is a son, kill it. There's no option in this matter. It was a command. But it said the midwives feared God. Listen. This is one of the reasons why I'm able to talk about things like this unapologetically and boldly because I fear God more than I fear trolls. I fear God more than I fear politics. I fear God more than I fear cancel culture. I can imagine that a few people on this stream or some people that might even hear this at a later date, you might be thinking like, man, I can't say nothing because I might get canceled. Man, I can't say anything because people might leave my church. Man, I can't say anything because where I work, I might lose my job. I can't say anything because, um, you know, I work a secular job and I can't lose my clients. I can't say anything. I'm not saying that you need to walk around uh, judging everybody who makes decisions that is contrary to what you believe. What I'm saying is anytime that somebody asks you what you believe, you need to be able to speak boldly on what you believe, proclaiming the word of God. Sometimes we are not asking for your opinion. We are asking, what does the word of God say about this situation? The word of God says that Satan comes to steal. He comes to kill and he comes to destroy. Let's not neglect the end of that verse. It also says, but I come to that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I'm, I'm, I speak boldly because I fear God. What can man do to me? And I wish, man, I, I believe that at Flowing Life, we're raising up a body of believers of people who fear God more than they fear people. Y'all, like, what, what, are we, what, what, what are we even talking about? Um, honestly, last year we had a discipleship course. And in discipleship, everything that we covered in discipleship, as my shirt says, duplicate Christ in culture. We were talking about being bold for Christ. We were talking about being more than just believers, more than just Christians, more than just confessing Christ as our Lord and Savior, but allowing him to actually be Lord over our lives and allow our lives to be a billboard. How can we talk about living for Christ if we're afraid of persecution? Nah, I'm not even talking about somebody threatening to kill you. I'm talking about just simple persecution, like somebody jumping in your comments and saying that they don't believe what you believe. I'm talking about persecution as in somebody saying they're not going to service your business because you stood firm on something that you believe. If we're not willing to endure persecution, then I would almost question your relationship with Christ itself. Maybe he's your savior, but is he your Lord? Does he call the shots in your life? Do you have to answer to him at the end of the day? Who are you more afraid of, God or people, man or God? Like what, what, like what? Ha, ah, let me slow myself down. It says in Exodus 17, the midwives feared God. Listen, this speaks volumes because he gave a command. The king gave a command. It wasn't opinion. 
He didn't say, hey, you know what? It's not very clear in the Bible what this says. This is kind of in one of those gray areas. So it, since it's in a gray area, I'm going to use my opinion. I'm going to use my thoughts. Um, you know, I'm just going to go by my own moral compass. Let me tell you something. Your own moral compass is jacked up. We are all born into sin, shapen in iniquity. When we are born, we are all inclined to sin. I like to give this example. When we are born, we're on a hill. And you imagine anything that you put on a hill is inclined to roll downhill. We're all born into sin, shaping into in, in, in iniquity. And so we are inclined to sin at any given moment. Your own moral compass will get you in trouble every time. If you don't believe me, ask the deepest person I believe in the Bible, the person who wrote two thirds of the Bible, and that is Paul, whom the, the, the very person who I think is one of the greatest pillars and, and, and staples of the Bible and, and, and of the gospel. This man said out of his very own might, mouth, he said, the things that I would do, I don't do. The things that I don't wanna do, I end up doing so things that are in those gray area. You cannot trust your own moral compass. You cannot trust your own thoughts. I'm sure with a lot of y'all and not just this situation, because I don't want y'all to be duped by this. It, it, it's not even about this, this isolated situation, uh, Roe v. Wade being overturned. Um, it, it, it's, it's not ice. It's, it's much bigger than that. It's so much bigger than that. It's about things that go on in politics that cause the gospel or, or Christians and believers to be divided in what they believe because we're going based off of our own moral compass instead of the word of God. I don't know about y'all, but this is relief for me. This actually gives me consolation to know that I don't have to go off of my personal opinion. Because if you, if, can I be honest with y'all? Let me know if I can be honest with you in the comments. If not, then I'll just sugarcoat it. We'll wash over it. I'll go ahead and end the stream now and we'll, 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 we'll just go about our business for the evening. But if you allow me to, I'll just be honest with you tonight. If you leave it to Pastor Ty and Pastor Ty's moral compass and what I feel and what I think about every little thing that comes up in politics, everything that comes up in the White House, everything that comes down the line with laws, with morals, with what people think. When people come to me all the time and they say, Pastor Ty, what's your thoughts? Pastor Ty, what do you think about this? Um, Pastor Ty, man, it would be good if you say something because you give language to people who maybe don't know what to say. Hey, a lot of my friends are asking, you know, how should a Christian feel about this? Pastor Ty, what do you think? What are your thoughts? How do you feel? And if I'm being completely honest with you, sometimes how I feel, I can't be honest with y'all tonight. <clears throat> I can't be honest with y'all tonight because I don't think y'all ready for it. I don't think y'all ready for it. <clears throat> Because this is Pastor Ty, right? This is our man of God who walks in the spirit, denies the flesh. So we who lives a fasted lifestyle, y'all not ready for the truth. <clears throat> Pastor Ty, what are your thoughts? How do you feel? Weigh in on this. <clears throat> if I'm being honest and I'm going by how I feel, if I'm going on by what I think, if I'm going based off of my own personal moral compass. I ain't even talking about pastor Ty no more. I'm just talking about Ty. If I'm going based off of my own moral compass, how I feel and what I think, a lot of times is contrary to the word of God. Yep, see, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Ain't nobody saying nothing. Ain't nobody saying, hey, man, glory to God. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, I know that's right. I'm feeling that. Yeah, that's me. I know that's right. Yep, y'all ain't willing to agree with that because y'all ain't ready for the truth. What do you think? How do you feel? What are your thoughts? I hope I don't lose y'all on this. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, it really ain't even about how I feel. It ain't even about what I think. It's about what does the word of God say? Now, listen, I ain't giving you no out. I'm not giving you an out. I'm not giving you an out enough for you to just say, oh, well, you know, well, well Bible. So that's what I'm going to leave it at. And people are asking you really sincere and honest questions. I'm not talking about trolls. I'm not talking about people who are looking to get in debates and arguments. What I'm talking about is people who are very sincere and they say, man, you know what? I just I, I want to know the truth. As a believer, what do I need to feel and think about this? And we comb through the word of God. And at the end of the day, 
Sometimes even when you can't find clarity, even in some of those gray areas, these are things that we need to pray about and ask Holy Spirit for guidance. Okay, Holy Ghost. Let, all right, let's, let's go deep, y'all. Let's go deep. Let's go deep. Let's go deep. Holy Spirit, um, there's some gray areas that may not necessarily be sin, right? Um, but how do I navigate it? Should I do it? How, should I not? Should I stay away from it? Or, or, or is there a fine line? I mean, can I kind of tiptoe? Uh, you know, what, 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 how, how do I navigate it? And these are things that we need to pray in the Spirit about and ask the Holy Spirit to give us direction and a conviction because some things are not very clear. You have people on all sides of divisive issues and they're saying, well, the word of God doesn't say, well, the word doesn't God, God doesn't show me in there in black and white that I can and that I can't. And the Holy Spirit needs to be your moral compass. You got people now trying to push laws that are trying to ban contraceptives. Y'all hear me. Y'all, 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 y'all hear me though. Y'all hear me though. Y'all hear me though. Um, they're trying to ban contraceptives. So if there is a law or if somehow they regulate contraceptives, then where do we fit this into our Bible? Where do we fit this into what are Christians supposed to do about this? <clears throat> it says in verse 17, but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded. Then we skip down to verse 20. It says, therefore, God dealt well with the midwives. It's amazing. Verse 21, it says, so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. The way that I read this was like, gosh, they fear God didn't do what the law actually regulated. But as a result of going against politics, the law, regulations, they went with their fear and their acknowledgement of God. As a result, God provided them households. Listen, I don't take this lightly what I just read. It doesn't seem random to me at all that they did not go with the law of the land. They could have said, man, you know what? This is legal. The word of God says that all things are permissible, but not everything is productive. Y'all, that's man, I could preach all by itself. Um, that yes, you can do all things according to the law. The law permits it. The law now regulates it. Um, God, but is this something I should do? It says that they went against what the king's command was. And as a result, it says that God dealt well with them. And then in the verse, next verse, it says, and, and so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. I don't take that lightly. To me, the way that I took that was like God provided protection for them. God covered them. Um, that God gave them the desires of their heart. That God put their family, oh my God, that God put their families back together under one roof, even after the king of the land tried to divide them, even after he tried to destroy them, even after he tried to literally kill their babies. Listen, y'all, this is another one of Satan's greatest attacks and one of his biggest weapons that he tries to use. Satan, hear me clearly when I say this, hear me loud and clear, because this is one that goes under the radar and he has so many tricks up his sleeves with this one that so much we get caught up on being divisive as a nation and even as believers that we miss out on what he's doing. It is not isolated to one situation. Listen, Satan is blood hungry and he is hungry for innocent blood. Satan is hungry for innocent blood. Um, <sighs> Roe v. Wade. Um, while Christians are divisive, arguing, fussing, fighting back and forth about political parties, Christians fighting, arguing about political parties, um, while Christians are fighting in the comments about whether or not the Bible says that abortion is uh, a sin or not, um, while Christians are debating back and forth just off of who's right and wrong, um, notice 
like I said, keep this in mind. Let this be the backdrop. Satan is blood hungry, especially for innocent blood. Notice how fast, how quick and how easy um, it was for them to overturn Roe v. Wade after all these years. Yet on the same table that they passed these regulations and laws, still can't pass no gun control laws. I'm going to let that sit right there for a minute. I'm going to let that settle in just for a moment. Yep, I'm going to let it settle. I think y'all need to think about that for a second. <clears throat> Roe v. Wade overturned after years. All of these mass shootings. Innocent blood spilled in schools, spilled on the street, supermarkets, spilled in the malls spilled in churches yet quick to pass or overturn a regulation um, to appease the people enough to cause them to turn a blind eye to gun control listen y'all i don't got no motive i don't got a dog in the fight i don't claim to be republican i don't claim to be democratic i live according to the word of god and this ain't no catch-all this ain't no oh well let me just say that so i can just cover everything that i'm about to say no i truly and i honestly believe it <clears throat> just like we just read in exodus the people got too mighty and so the king said hey let's put something in place um to distract them from becoming mighty Let's put something in place um, that will cause them to be so worn out that they turn away their attention from the real issue at hand. Um, let's give them something um, that would appease their appetite, um, that will cause them to rejoice with victory. Yes, as a Christian, we should be rejoicing. We should, we, we, we got victory because uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned. <clears throat> Is the victory that Christians are still fighting over it and torn about it? Satan is after innocent blood. Innocent blood. He's blood hungry. So while we're while we while we as Christians are focused um, on other things, it's causing our attention to be pulled away from other important things. Yep, unapologetically. Just like I said in verse seventeen, they fear God more than they fear people. He's after innocent blood. I'm going to try my best to end on this note. 737. I told y'all before. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Um, if I can steal the man from the household, I can kill the family. Um, if I can remove the seed or what a woman was created to nurture... I can destroy the family. I'm going to give you another weapon of Satan. If he can destroy the seed before it grows, he can destroy a whole generation. Satan is out for innocent blood and whoever he can use as a point of contact, as a trigger man, as a go-getter to go after, that's who he will use. He is after innocent blood. I said it on Sunday. The quickest way to kill a king or the best way to kill a king is to kill it while it's a kid. Um, the easiest way to kill somebody who is anointed is to kill them before they know. Oh my God. Thank you. Holy Spirit. Whew. God, man, y'all on here at the right time. 
Here it comes. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Satan's after, Satan's after your anointing. Satan is after your gift. Satan is after your purpose. Satan is after what God put in you from the beginning of time. He knows that he cannot kill it once you take off. He knows that you, he cannot kill it once you understand your identity. He knows he cannot kill it once you understand your purpose. He knows he cannot kill it once you start walking heavy in who you are. He knows that he can't kill it once you understand what you have on the inside of you. The only way that he can steal, kill, and destroy is if he catches it while you're still a kid. If he catches it before you even know that you have it. If he catches it before you truly understand what you're walking with. In Psalms 139, it says that I was fearfully and wonderfully made, that you saw my unformed body, that you written out all of my days even before I lived one. This is why this is so important, because if Satan can take you out before you're formed, then he got you. If he can take you out before you understand that your days were written, then he got you. If he can take you out before you can see it, then he has you. I'm here to declare tonight that Satan should have taken me out before I understood my purpose. He should have taken me out before I understood my calling. He should have taken me out before I started op operating in my anointing. He should have taken me out before I started dreaming, before I started having visions. He should have taken me out before last Sunday when Pastor Ty and Lady ha Taryn laid hands on us and anointed us and set us apart for a holy purpose. He should have taken us out, but here's the thing than he would have already. And the fact that he didn't means that he can't. And so being that he cannot, I challenge you and I charge you tonight to walk heavy in the anointing that God has an assignment on your life. Do, oh my God, here it goes. And here's the title for the whole night. Gave it to me. Do not abort your spiritual baby. Somebody put it in the comments. Do not abort your spiritual baby. Do not abort your spiritual baby. Do not abort your spiritual baby. I feel like we need to see it. I feel like we need to see it. I feel like we need to see it. Matthew chapter two. I'm going to try my best to end y'all. I'm going to try my best. Holy Ghost. Thank you. Thank you. Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter two. I might not have time to read it. I might just have to give it to you. King Herod. Matthew chapter two, King Herod. This is the prophetic word that came forward. It was prophesied, excuse me. It was prophesied years before they got there. In verse six of Matthew chapter two, in verse six, it said, but you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the rulers of Judah for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people of Israel. This was spoken prophetically that Jesus the Christ the king of Israel, the king of the Jews, that he would be born in Bethlehem. You don't believe me? It's in verse two. It's saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? King is in the capital K, king of the Jews. Where is he? This is what Herod is asking. In verse three, it says, when Herod, the king, lowercase king, y'all got to see that, heard this, he was troubled in all of Jerusalem with him. He was troubled because it was prophesied that a king of the Jews, he was king. Right. He was king over Jerusalem, but it was prophesied that a new king was coming, a king who would not only reign over the people. Oh, my God, but a king of the world. Right. He was troubled because he knew that somebody was coming that would not only take his place, but would overtake all of the evil that he represented. Oh, my God. Why is this important? He tried to take out Jesus even before Jesus was born. He couldn't catch him when he was born. So he said, man, you know what? If I can kill Jesus before Jesus knows who he is. If I can kill Jesus while Mary and Joseph are still trying to kind of figure out this whole immaculate conception, then I'll be able to not only take out Jesus, but I'll be able to take out his family. Here's one of the weapons of the enemy. If I can take out this family, then I can take out an entire generation. And that's what he is after. Satan is out for innocent blood. He's not just okay with taking out one person unless this one person is an ambassador to a whole nation. He's not just taking out, he's not just for taking out one family unless this one family is the first family that is leading thousands of people. 
He is not just trying to take out one nation unless this nation is a nation that has influence around the world. The reason why he is trying to take you out is not because you're so special in and of yourself. It's not because of how you dress. It's not because you cute. I'm sorry. He's not trying to take you out because you're from a good family. He's trying to take you out because you are anointed for such a time as this. He's trying to take you out because you know the truth and the truth is in you and the truth that is in you will set other people free. He is trying to take you out because you have a calling on your life. And even though you've been running from it, you know that you can't run from it any longer. Satan is almost more familiar with your calling than you are. And because he knows the call of God on your life, because he sees the signs of it, he sees what's coming down the pipeline. No, he cannot see the future, but he sees the signs on your life. He sees the calling. He sees and he knows that you will become more than what you are right now. And so if I can take it out in its infant stage, I won't have to worry about fighting it when it's full grown. Satan is a lion roaring, seeking whom he may devour, not looking for people that'll be an even match. Um, he, he, he's not looking to take on a whole pack of deer or zebra or gazelle, right? Um, this past week I was in Africa. I'm talking uh, to some of the locals and we're, we just so happen to be in an area um, where they have natural habitat, where lions live, where zebra live, where gazelle live, uh, where monkeys live, where elephants live, where crocodiles live. You got all sorts of wildlife. And I'm talking because I want to know about wildlife. I'm not used to having random lions up the street. I'm not used to waking up and hearing zebra outside the back door. I'm not used to walking through a trail and seeing a giraffe eating from a tree. I'm just not used to that. I, that's not where I came up. I came up as a city boy. I don't know about the safari in Africa. This is what I was told when I was there, right? I found out, and y'all know this already, but I found out firsthand um, that the lions go after whom they can devour, right? Um, lions are courageous. Um, they're the king of the jungle. Not because they're the strongest, they're not. Not because they're the biggest, they're not. Not because they're the most intelligent, they're not. Not because they're the, the fastest, they're not. Not because their teeth are the sharpest, they're not. They're the king of the jungle because of their courage. This is the irony that I find in Satan comparing himself or God comparing Satan as a roaring lion. Um, the lion is a king of a jungle because of his courage. Yet, Satan is described as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. As a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So he's not looking for a fair fight. I said this already. Satan is after innocent blood. He is after innocent blood. God forbid, and I hate to say it, but we've not seen the last massacre. We've not seen the last mass shooting. Why? Because politics cares more about money, care more about power, cares more about um, uh, their political party than they do about people. Roe v. Wade decision wasn't made because of people. Roe v. Wade wasn't overturned before Christians or believers. There were political workings in place to push. Listen, y'all, we cannot be distracted. Satan is still out looking to see who he can devour. And he's devouring Christians while we're busy arguing with other Christians, while we're busy in our comments and DMs going back and forth with people about stuff that really at the end of the day don't even matter. What does the word of God say about the situation? And that's what I'm standing on. And that's what I'm living by. Jesus. Oh, God. He's out for innocent blood. I'll end on this part right here. <sighs> Isaiah, uh, actually Jeremiah chapter one. He said, Jeremiah, I'm sorry, I don't have time to go to these verses. I gave you Exodus chapter two, Psalms 139. I don't have notes tonight, y'all. This is a download. Um, Exodus chapter two. 
um, Psalms 139, Matthew chapter 2, and now Jeremiah chapter 1. You can check them out when you get a chance. Um, Jeremiah chapter 1 says this. It says, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. Kind of parallel Psalms 139. You saw my unformed body. You're written out my days even before I lived one. <clears throat> Satan is out for innocent blood before you know what you're carrying, before you know what you have. He wants to remove it. He wants to kill it. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy before you even know that you had it. Why would you put up a fight with Satan for something that he stole that you didn't even know that belonged to you? Why would you go after something that you didn't even know was in your possession? Many Christians walking around right now distracted. Many Christians and believers walking around right now not putting up a fight for the things that deserve a fight, but wasting their time with fights that are meaningless because they don't even know what belongs to them. Backing down um, from 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 uh, from the things that from the, the from the fights that God is calling them to that their anointing is strong enough to conquer because they don't even know that they're anointed for it. He says to Jeremiah, he says, <clears throat> I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. I called you to be a prophet to the nations. Satan is out for innocent blood because you don't even know you're a prophet. You don't even know you're an evangelist. You don't even know that, 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 that the gifts of the spirit are lying dormant on the inside. You don't even know that you have the gift of prophecy. You don't even know that you have the gift of interpretation or the gift of tongue. You don't even know that you have the gift of healing. You don't, you don't, you don't even know that you have a gift of discernment. Like you, you don't even know that you carry it. And so you don't know to fight for it. Jesus. Even in, um, even in Genesis, the Bible makes a distinction between created and form. That man was created before he was formed, which means that he was a thought in God's mind. He created it, similar to us putting it on paper. But then when he formed man, it was him causing it to rain and the water turned and the ground turned to clay. And then he began to shape and he began to form. Satan is out to kill you before you're formed. And even once you're formed, when you're sitting in your mother's womb, he's out to take you out before you're born. It doesn't stop here, y'all. This is not the fight. This is this is not the argument right here. Um, if we're going to fight about what happens in the womb, we got to fight. We got to fight about everything from the womb to the tomb. Like, like we got to fight about life in general. If, if you care so much about life in the womb, then you have to care so much about life outside the womb, too. I can't just love the people that are lovable. I have to love the people that are unlovable. Listen, I'm about to say a lot of stuff that I know that y'all probably ain't, on, ain't gonna agree with, but I told you at the beginning, I ain't put no caption on this because I know who I'm talking to tonight. Listen, if you love the person in the womb, you're gonna have to love the person outside the womb. And the person outside the womb is also a person that's a different color, is a different persuasion. Is a different culture. You're going to have to love the people that you like and the people that you don't like. You're going to have to love the people that sin against you and the people that treat you real good. You're going to have to love the people that cuss you out and the people that speak well of you. You're going to have to love the people that are ugly and the people that are pretty. You're going to have to love the people who spit in your face and the people who hold your hand. You're going to have to love the people who stink and the people who smell good. You're going to have to love the people in America and the people in third world countries. Because love knows no boundaries. Love knows no limits. Love's no, love knows no colors. Love doesn't know a newborn from an old person. Love knows no boundaries. If you love them in the womb, you're going to have to love them to the tomb. God created us, formed us. Satan don't stop there. He wants to take you out at every turn. I don't care if you're a child, I don't care if you're a teenager, I don't care if you're a young adult, I don't care if you're a seasoned saint, I don't care who you are, he is after your blood. And everybody on this stream tonight as I prepare to close, I want to pray for you tonight. Satan's out for you. He's after you. 
I don't care if you're the person on here tonight or, or maybe you're the person on here tonight who, who maybe you say, man, you know what, Pastor Todd, I'm familiar with some of my gifts. I'm familiar with some of the things that God has anointed me to do. I'm pretty familiar with my purpose, my call in life. Man, you know what? That's awesome. You ain't off the hook. Satan's still after you because there are people that God has called you to deliver that haven't been delivered yet. <sighs> Y'all ain't saying nothing. <clears throat> Bondage is over that you've not gone to yet. Um, there are people group that God has called you to that maybe you're afraid of because you're afraid of rejection. There are people that God has called you to, but you have not gone to yet because maybe you've not completely delivered. There are people that God has called you to, but you've not gone to them yet because maybe the same thing that they're dealing with is the same thing that you went through. And because you went through it, you've not quite gotten your uh, closure on it just yet. So how can I really minister to somebody and I've not quite gotten closure yet? If he sent you out, then he'll give you what you need. Sometimes you don't need to be equipped with everything when he sends you out. But sometimes once you go, he'll give you what you need as you go. Who am I talking to tonight? Listen, just because you know who you are, you know your identity, you know your purpose, you know your calling does not let you off the hook. The fact that you still have breath in your lungs means that there are still people that God has called you to. How much longer will those people have to suffer because you have not completely answered the call of God in your life? How many more people have to die at your hands? Y'all listen, listen, let me fix that up a little bit for you because this ain't no condemnation. I don't want you to feel bad about it. But if you have not answered the call of your God, if you have not answered the call of God on your life, then daily people are dying because they are waiting for you to show up. There's an anointing on your life that that for some people groups only you can break. And if you don't show up, then God will raise up another people. But how many years is it going to take them to show up? Maybe the person that God has to raise up in your stead or because you're making excuses or because you're, you're, you're afraid. Maybe the person that God has to raise up is an infant right now. So what if, able, what if Satan is able to snatch them up before they know who they are? How long will people have to wait until they're old enough to walk heavy in their anointing? Nope. No more spiritual abortions. No more spiritual abortions. Somebody say it in the chat. No more spiritual abortions. Nope. Can't do it. Not my life or anybody connected to me. If it's family, I'm not afraid to say something. If it's friends, I'm not afraid to speak up. If it's associates, then I'm, I'm going to have to put my foot down. Even if it's a total stranger and I find myself in a conversation where they've lost hope and they're ready to get up, give up. I'm sorry. I need to say something. No more spiritual abortions. You will fulfill the call of God on your life. I don't care if it's in its infant stage or if it is matured. I believe that God will guard it, that God will protect it, that God will keep it until it becomes mature enough to stand on its own. And even when it does, I believe that God will cover it in the blood of Jesus as he sends you out in the uncharted territory to be able to declare freedom over those who are in bondage. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. No more spiritual abortions. Oh, God. Whew. No more spiritual stillbirths. Oh, God, I hate it. Thank you, Lord. No more spiritual miscarriages. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Jesus. Father, I thank you that you're covering in the blood of Jesus. Every dream. Every vision. Every prophetic word spoken over their lives. Everything that you showed them in private. I thank you that it will come to pass. And that it will not delay. 
Satan, you are ugly. You're nasty. You're stupid for messing with God's people. Assume your position as defeated. You no longer has jur you no longer have jurisdiction over these people. We're putting a spike in the ground tonight. Putting our foot down. No longer being persuaded any other way. God, we love you more than our fear of people. We honor you more than our fear of politics or cancel culture. Bring to pass everything that you'll put on the inside of us. Protect it, guard it, and cover it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Whew. I told y'all, I was very intentional about not putting up no caption tonight because I knew my assignment for tonight. I knew exactly who I needed to speak to. Um, and for the people who jumped in tonight, even those who are watch at a later date, um, <laughs> Q's Miley music, I hate you. <laughs> you a lie, you a cheat, you defeat it. Um, I knew exactly who I need to speak to tonight. Um, I'm not the type of person that likes to stir up controversy. I'm not a troll. I'm not the type of person um, that likes to stir up the pot just for ratings or clickbait. I absolutely could have put a title um, that I knew people would have flooded in here just to either hear or to disturb the peace a little bit. Um, I love God more than I love controversy. I respect God too much to play with his word or to play with his people. Um, but at the same time, I'm not afraid to stand. You said it, hashtag truth. That's exactly what it is. I'm not afraid to stand for truth. Um, I firmly believe and I will not back down um, from two words that me and my wife always stand on in any divisive or controversial topic or subject. Um, and that is grace and truth. Grace and truth. It ain't even completely about Roe v. Wade, y'all. Um, it's not even just about mass shootings or gun control. It's not even completely about politics. It's about Satan being after innocent blood and him being blood hungry and wanting to take you out. Not just before. If you get, it'll be easier to take you out before you know who you are. Um, but even after. Yeah. Um, but we speak the truth, the truth and grace with grace, understanding that with every controversial subject, there are always nuances, which I could speak on a lot of those, but don't even have time to go into it tonight. Um, could speak on a lot of the percentages, the politics, the, um, the research studies, the, the history of all of the different controversial stuff subjects. I I looked it up. I got it. I felt like tonight you needed to hear the root of a lot of the controversy. Don't be swayed or persuaded or duped or lied to by the surface. Listen, y'all it's far beyond the surface because all of these controversies all have the same root. Satan is not playing no games with y'all. So we cannot play no games with him. The root of it at the end of the day is he's trying to kill, steal, and destroy. Y'all, the pattern is the same. If your spiritual eyes would just be open to the games that he's playing, the pattern is the same. Trust me, in a couple of weeks, there's going to be another divisive issue, not just amongst politics or political parties, but amongst Christians as well. It happens all the time and it keeps happening over and over and over again until you recognize the pattern. The root of it is Satan wants to kill steal and destroy that is the underlying issue if we could just see past all the devices in this all of this stuff with the january um six panel y'all can read into that look into that keep up with it 
cool it's good it's good to know history of what's going on in the world but at the end of the day the plot is the same um, it's good to get involved in politics and gun control and civil rights and all of that but at the end of the day the plot is still the same it's good to get involved uh, involved with um, you know whether it's abortion laws or, uh, or your local legislation that's good that's that's perfect that's part of the grace aspect of grace and truth right get dirty and get involved and find out what are what's hurting the people where the people's hearts are um, what's causing them to make these decisions you know um, and and to get involved and provide resources Resources for all of these people that's cool but the truth behind it all is that the pattern is still the same Satan is blood hungry and if he could he would devour all of us all with one sweep but he can't so he has to be very deceptive very conniving and very strategic and even as Exodus pointed out very shrewd uh, very shrewd um, in all of his ploys in all of his actions to try to pick us off one by one and or try to take us out in mass uh, shootings or mass genocide. Um, but the underlying issue is still the same to steal, kill and destroy because he's blood hungry. Listen, I'm praying for y'all just like I have already tonight. Always praying for y'all. Um, I love y'all. And that's why I have to speak truth. Um, and the gospel sometimes is offensive. Not sometimes. The gospel is offensive. The gospel is offensive. Um, but that's why Jesus came with grace and truth so that he can meet people where they are, but then give them truth for the people who desire it. That's why he spoke in parables for the people who don't want it. Um, he's a he's a stumbling stone. He's a stumbling block. Uh, for the people who desire it, they'll take it as truth. Man, this is gospel and it's a stepping stone. Um, and so that's what I desire for tonight. Thank you um, for this opportunity to share with your people. Um, I pray that something tonight that I shared maybe encouraged somebody not just to speak with truth absent of grace, uh, but for somebody else to speak with grace and truth. Um, Father, I pray that our love for you will exceed our fear of cancel culture. <sighs> yeah, I've seen it happen, y'all, already. Uh, just last week, a whole business was canceled that has been operating for years just because of one statement about Roe v. Wade. Father, I pray our love for you will exceed any fear of cancel culture, will exceed any fear of what our family, what our friends believe, um, but will go beyond the surface even of what we believe uh, and deal with the root cause of all of these divisive issues and that is calling Satan on the carpet for being blood hungry and after innocent blood willing to steal, kill, and destroy everything. God, help us to mount up to be bold in our stance, be willing to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Listen, man, I love y'all. Um, y'all have a great evening. Um, share this with somebody who you believe that it'd be a blessing to. Don't go around sharing it with, with strolls, with <laughs> just strolls, um, with trolls or people that look at the debate, look and, listen, I ain't looking to debate, I ain't looking for a fight, um, but always be willing uh, to take a stand for, to justify and defend your faith. That's what the word of God says. Always be willing to defend your faith. Always have a word in and out of every season and be willing to be persecuted because that's what this Christian life is all about. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Listen, righteous, this, this persecution, this is little, this is little stuff. This, this little stuff. I know y'all got it. Y'all have a good night. Uh, we'll see you bright and early Sunday morning. Let's go.